Can Guatemala overcome its reputation as being unsafe for tourists and become a world-class destination? On this week's programme, we travel to one of Central America's most spectacular countries to discover what's stopping some tourists from going there. We head to Buenos Aires to take some tuition in tango. Thought old-style photo booths were a thing of the past? Well, we meet the men bringing them back to the streets of Europe. And if you've ever wanted to learn how to do this, we'll show you where and how. From ancient ruins to beautiful natural landscapes and a living Maya culture, the Central American country of Guatemala has an awful lot to offer tourists. In the southwest, the city of Antigua, with its cobbled streets and beautiful colonial architecture, has earned the city UNESCO World Heritage status. The city was the centre of Spanish colonial rule in Guatemala for hundreds of years and today it's the top destination for tourists arriving in the country. A particularly popular time to visit is in March and April when the city's famous Easter processions fill the streets. Guatemala is a growing destination for international tourists, attracting over two million of them for the first time ever in 2013. Yet there is a factor holding some people back. It's the country's reputation for violent crime. There are up to 100 homicides per week here on average, making Guatemala one of the deadliest countries in the world. Drug-related and gang violence mean some areas, particularly in the capital of Guatemala City, are simply too dangerous for visitors. And even in tourist areas like Antigua, muggings are not uncommon. Travel advisories around the world recommend taking special precautions. Yesterday there was a procession for the first Sunday in Lent and I was very busy taking photographs. I got really good photographs <laughs> and my bag was slashed and my wallet went really quickly. <laughs> well, you just have to use common sense. Don't go out too late at night, stay close to your house, have a good time during the daytime. I haven't had any problems whatsoever and I've been here for a couple of months. In an effort to reduce crime against visitors, Antigua has formed a special tourist police force to patrol busy areas. With tourist numbers on the rise, new businesses are popping up to cater for them, including a new Guatemalan restaurant opened by broadcaster and former war correspondent Harris Whitbeck. I think tourism, if managed properly, uh, is the future for Guatemala. Yes, there are problems, but if you relax also and really allow the culture to speak to you, uh, you'll find that it's a beautiful country, it's a, full of wonderful people, and, you know, I think that the good always outweighs the bad. I mean, of course you have to be careful, but I think that people will find that it's a pretty great place. One group that Guatemala is really trying to attract is adrenaline junkies, with zipline tours like this one just five minutes from the centre of Antigua. Wish me luck. The tour takes place above an old coffee plantation where nine zip lines are arranged at a height of up to 1,600 feet. Ah! First up, the safety equipment. Ah, so the, the zip line goes... Exactly. Okay. It's double. Is this a good time to mention that I'm really scared of heights? I'm not. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs>
Guatemala is surrounded by volcanoes, like Amazing. mountains and all that thing. So it's perfect for us because we can work with that and give you a very experience when you come to our country. In the north of the country is one of the world's most important archaeological sites. Tikal, a series of gargantuan ruins spread over 10 square miles and beyond. It was once a thriving centre of the Mayan Empire, and today it receives around 350,000 visitors per year. But when you spread that number out over Tikal's huge area, it's not difficult to find a quiet spot to yourself. What's truly astounding about this place is that there are these ruins spread everywhere, some of the best I've seen in the world, and yet there's no one here. John Telfer led the first international group tour to the country in 1985. Today, he's back to research a new tour in the region and feels that Guatemala has been underrated as a destination. I think it's a gross case of people being quite ignorant about the place. There's lots of other places which have a lot more space in, in the media. It's a great shame. You have the rainforest and the bird life, the howler monkeys, the mists floating over the top of the canopy in the morning. It's one of the finest places to visit on the planet. The time may soon come when Guatemala's great potential for tourism is realized and the hordes will descend. But in the meantime, this place will continue to be a hidden gem for travellers to explore. Well, if you're thinking of heading to Guatemala, here's some more information you might find useful. It's worth checking your government's travel advice website before you head off in order to get the latest information. Despite the high crime rate, most visits here are trouble free. But just to stay on the safe side, it's best to avoid catching the brightly coloured public buses like these found across the country. El Mirador is also a place to visit if you've got time on your hands. It was a major Mayan city that flourished from about the 6th century BC and was abandoned at the end of the 9th century. But be warned, it takes a gruelling trek of at least five days through the jungle to get there. The procession season in Antigua runs from early March until Easter and it's one of the busiest times to visit so be sure to book well ahead. Tango. Since its invention in the 1890s, no other genre of music seems to sum up the passion, the beauty, the sex, and the attitude of Buenos Aires so perfectly. But the tango we know is not always the tango that was. See, almost a hundred years ago, one baritone voice performer would, with one startling act, catapult tango from a lower class pastime to a classy international phenomenon. And that man's name? Carlos Gardel. When Gardel put lyrics to a previously instrumental music, it created a massive stir, both in Uruguay and Argentina. So big was the stir that the international media got a hold of it and thus became our introduction to tango. I was essentially looking for the first tango song the world had ever known. And so my first stop was La Boca, a picturesque Bohemia known for its homage to all things tango. But this place was not the answer. Every single person I approached wanting to talk about tango with wanted money. Every time I tried to take a photo, somebody wanted a tip. So if I'm looking for the real tango in Buenos Aires, it's definitely not going to be here in La Boca. Next, I headed to Abastos, the neighborhood that Gardel supposedly grew up in. But that was equally exasperating, as even on the street dedicated to him, no one was around. Needing to go inside and warm up for a bit, I headed to the trendy area of Palermo to visit a record shop that I had seen earlier. I had originally passed it off as too rock and roll for what I was after, but I thought I'd at least ask whoever was inside for some guidance. But the owner, Paco, didn't seem too hopeful. 
<laughs> it's yeah, gonna be hard, man. Like, nobody carries grandma phones now. You could get like a really fine vinyl copy, maybe a, a really good audio print. Uh, I know a place you could go to. Nobody knows about that place. I don't tell my customers because I buy my Tango records and the stuff I sell here, there. But uh, you deserve it because you came a long way to find that song, man. And so my treasure hunt had been changed from an old gramophone record to an old Odeon recording. Found a Tango collection, found Gardell, and found my treasure. A four screen background with Gardell smiling back at me, and on the back, side two, song two, Mi Noche Trista. <laughs> And now, time for this week's travel update. Germany's main airports were hit by a strike action this week as more than 6,000 workers walked out in a dispute over pay. More than 1,500 flights were cancelled and delayed at airports across the country. These dramatic pictures show the moment a Chicago metro train derailed at O'Hare International Airport, injuring 32 people earlier this week. The train came off the tracks, crossed a platform and travelled part way up an escalator. Amazingly, none of the reported injuries were serious. The Burmese government have placed a ban on the construction of more hotels in Bagan, which is home to thousands of temples and shrines. It blames the previous military regime for allowing unsightly hotels in the heart of the ancient complex 20 years ago. And if you're heading to New York this weekend and you're a lover of all things sweet, then be sure to visit the city's first ever cupcake vending machine. The Cupcake ATM, which launched on the Upper East Side, holds cupcakes of up to 16 different flavours to satisfy your sugar cravings around the clock. Still to come on The Travel Show. Ever thought about becoming an acrobat but no time to run away to the circus? We'll take you to a place in London where you can live your dreams for a day or two. So see you after the break. Welcome back to The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Next up, London's East End, famous for its arty hangouts, bars, restaurants and gig venues rammed with hipsters. But what's less well known is that it's also home to one of the best circus schools in the world, the National Centre for Circus Arts. They're now offering visitors to the capital the chance to learn from the experts. The Travel Show went along to take a look. The kind of circus we're talking about here at the National Centre is very much acrobatic and aerial based. It has to have an element, well, I call it the wow factor. And if it doesn't make you go, wow, it's probably not very successful circus. <laughs> But equally, it has to have aesthetic as well, you know, so you can't get away with just being a daredevil. You do have to have an aesthetic, and that's what makes an artist. Mm. 
the National Centre for Circus Arts is not just about people wanting to train to become professional artists, although that does happen. Experience days are offered at the weekends and people come in from the outside and get to try different skills. So it might be flying trapeze, it might be acrobalance, it might be juggling or tight wire, but they'll get to try different things and have some fun doing it. I just got to the end of the tightrope. Um, it was incredibly satisfying. Uh, I went from only taking two steps in a row and falling off to getting all the way to the end in just one big leap. Um, and I just had to stop thinking. It was fantastic. So when people come in and it's the first time ever on the trapeze, normally they're scared, a bit apprehensive, which is a totally human reaction, totally get that. But they're excited too and they're enthusiastic and that's quite infectious. So as a teacher, that's brilliant. <laughs> so keep stretching up. Right, Zach, so now that we've got your safety belt on, what we're actually going to do is put you up on the flying trapeze. You're going to be standing up there with those two lovely women who are going to help you. And Great. it's all about keeping your arms straight when you first get on the bar there. Yeah. Keeping your head up. Yeah? Head up. Nothing to it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually uh, pretty bad at heights. I'm one of those people who are the last to jump in a swimming pool. Um, but I figured, you know, why not? I'm here in London, so I'll give it a go. My first thoughts were loss is a lot higher than I had expected. Um, after that, it was I really hope I don't fall before I get my hands on the bar. I was glad to find that I actually did it well. I felt like at least, I don't know how it looked. Um, but it was really awesome, so exhilarating. I actually felt very secure the entire time with keeping both hands on the ropes and then the connections. And then of course having two professionals by my side might have helped a little bit. I had a blast, um, I want to do it again. You normally get people who just want to do it as a hobby and that's fine, you know, and that's most of what we do here for the adults and the children, that's what we do. Um, but occasionally you get somebody who starts doing it as a hobby and actually is quite good at it and then wants to do a bit more and then actually why don't I apply for full-time training, why don't I become an acrobat or a trapeze artist and that's great. It doesn't happen often but when it does, fantastic. So not one for the faint-hearted but you can tell your mates back home that you've run away to join the circus if only for the day. A typical lesson costs around 70 pounds or 120 US dollars, but if you're not heading to the capital, there are a handful of other venues around the UK where you can learn to swing from a trapeze. Now, many of us had our first passport pictures taken in these, but they've all but disappeared in many parts of the world. Old style mechanical photo booths have given way to their more up to date digital counterparts but two men in Berlin have a passion for bringing a touch of retro technology back to the streets of Europe. Take another picture with your camera. Take another picture with your click, 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 click camera. So this is photo automat. This is actually the very first photo automat that we put in the streets of Berlin. And it's still holding up pretty well 10 years in. We together we did a documentation about an art project and then we uh, we used one of the old vintage photo booths that still have been there in Zurich at this time. And then the, the idea came up to put one of these booths in Berlin because we both loved it so much. We started out of the pure fascination of this old machine with, with its unique uh, 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 photographic um, quality. And the, the, for, to our own surprise, the project uh, or the booth was well received uh, uh, 
among uh, Berlin people. <laughs> now we have around 20 photo booths in Berlin and we have two in Hamburg and one in Leipzig. And then we have some, some of our friends and relatives also run in cooperation with us some photo booths in different cities in Europe, actually in London, Vienna, Florence, and Cologne. It wasn't a business idea, but it was um, the fascination for this actual photo booth, for the, for the process of taking a photo in a photo booth and the actual photo stripe, which I, we see today, everybody has a camera, but nobody's actually thinking about photography. I think that's what makes these photo booths uh, popular too, because you know, for once the people are confronted with photography and the abilities, it's actually a physical product, you can smell it, you can see it, and it's something to think about. These machines uh, are also, when we started, they, the only place you could find them actually were museums. There were really like birds inside, you know, living birds inside, and cats and stuff. But we are able to put this back into working condition. So that's kind of the expertise that we have to bring these machines back to life. My best photo at the moment memory was when I took a lot of pictures with my best friend and then I made a photo wall in my room of all the pictures. With my best friend when I was 14, uh, we went into the photo booth and took a lot of photos. Unfortunately, we're not friends anymore, but I, I still remember her and I still have those beautiful photos. Part of the appeal is we don't put it in safe places, we put it out in the street where the real street life happens. There is no surveillance here, There's, it's, um, it's just out in the street and anything could happen. It's a lovely process, it's fun work. It's fun, so um, we're here and we have holidays and it's a nice memory to look at the pictures and know, oh, that was in Berlin and it was funny, so um, I think it's nice. The project bringing photo booths back to the streets of Germany. Well, that's it from us this week. Thank you for joining us on our travels and here's where we're off to next week. Thailand might have a reputation for being a sun and sea destination, but Henry goes off-road to explore another side of the country. What these machines are really built for is off-roading, and that's exactly where I'm going to take it. So do join us there if you can. And in the meantime, don't forget, you can keep up with us while we're on the road in real time by signing up to our social media feeds, details of which are appearing on the screen right now. But for now, from me, Krista Larwood, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Guatemala, it's adios. Oh, 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 oh,